Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, Pediatric Teaching for today. Um, this is the eighth uh, session we've had so far this year, plus three additional epidemiology sessions. So um, one of the reasons why I've um, talked about the topics I have so far is because many of the other topics are actually already online. So if you get a chance and you want to review some other topics that we are not we haven't yet talked about then please go back to them there's lots about respiratory disease and cardiovascular disease and other things online but today i wanted to talk about um, x-ray interpretation and particularly about how to interpret chest x-rays and try to give you a, an understanding of how to in, how to interpret chest x-rays and some common pathology that occurs in pediatric chest x-rays and how we can uh, really make diagnoses just based on the clinical findings and the chest x-ray. All right, let's 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 go. So the, the session is really about the or an orientation to reading pediatric chest x-rays and then an overview of some of the common pathology that we, we see on pediatric chest x-rays. So what when you're looking at a chest x-ray, this is real basic things, but when you're looking at it, you need to say something about the inspiration, something about the rotation, and something about the penetration. And, and there's some simple rules to know how to just assess those things on a chest x-ray. You all know about um, a good, good inspiratory film, and it's important to know which ribs you're counting. When you're counting ribs, it's important to know which ribs you're counting. If I'm I'm taking this one first up, you can see my cursor, I think this one and that one, I'm counting posterior ribs, okay? If I'm taking this one and this one and this one, I'm counting anterior ribs. And because the number of ribs that you should see differs whether you're counting posterior ribs or anterior ribs. And a good inspiratory film has 19 posterior ribs. So you can see uh t1 here um by the first rib that's coming out and then t2 and then t3 and you can count down like that that helps you know the levels of the thoracic vertebra because the for example uh t1 the t1 um a rib comes in just at the top of the vertebral body of of uh, t the t1 vertebral body so when you're counting ribs, know whether you're counting posterior ribs or anterior ribs, and it's nine or ten posterior ribs you should see, or seven seven anterior ribs. Now, so that's that's a poor inspiratory film often leads to a misunderstanding of the pathology. Sometimes if you've got poor inspiration, then the lung structures will be quite condensed. And that and people often mistake that for pneumonia or atelectasis or collapse when in fact it's simply that the child hasn't taken a big enough breath in or the x-ray wasn't taken when the child actually took a big breath in and often you see basal uh, atelectasis so don't be fooled by that it's not necessarily not 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 necessarily indicating pneumonia it might just be that the child hasn't taken a big breath in the second thing is about rotation and you can have rotation of an x-ray in three different planes. But the one we most commonly assess is, is a sort of lateral rotation. And that is that you should see that the clavicular heads, which come in he about here, are equidistant between each other and uh, an equal space between the trachea, the tracheal shadow, the air, air trache the air in the tracheal shadow, and the, the, um, the clavicular heads. That's a, that's a way to assess it. And then the last one is about penetration. And the way I always think about penetration is if you, if you can't see the vertebral body behind the heart, then it's probably an underpenetrated film. Uh, um, so what you should see is the what the radiologists say is the ghostly outline of the vertebral bodies behind the heart. Remember, the heart is a, is a soft tissue and... And the you won't see the outline very clearly, but you should see the vertebral body outline behind that soft tissue shadow of the heart. If you can't see it, if it all looks just white, then it's usually an underpenetrated film. And if it looks 
very translucent, then it may well be over penetrated. So those three things, inspiration, rotation and penetration, are things you should at least um, comment on and be able to know how to interpret the changes you see in relation to those those three things, inspiration, rotation and penetration, because a, 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 a poor X-ray with inadequate penetration or with rotation or with a poor inspiration can actually mimic pathology and we can get it wrong if we don't have a good uh, if we don't have a good x-ray i wanted to talk about this um, x-ray change because it's something we relatively commonly see i'm not sure can can anyone suggest what this change is on this x-ray Well, maybe for the purposes of time, I'll, I'll just say that this is like a whiteout of a hemithorax. And this is a common scenario where we see a whiteout of a hemithorax where the, the left hemithorax, there's um, you can see the lung tissue there and you can see lung markings. You can see the left heart border. It's a bit shifted to the left, but there's a whiteout of the, of the right hemithorax. You can see the tracheal shadow it's a reasonably well-centered film. So it's it's well-centered. The trachea is equidistant between the clavicular heads. You can see the left main bronchus and the right main bronchus coming down, but it seems to be a bit angled differently. But the main the main thing to see is that there's a white out of the hemithorax. On the on the left side, you can see the the left the left hemidiaphragm, and on the right side you can't see the hemidiaphragm. So Everything is whited out. And I guess I wanted to just go through the different causes of a whiteout of the of a, of a single hemithorax because it's something we commonly see and often we jump to a conclusion, but there's there's four things it can be. I've, I've described this to some of you before, but there's only four things that will give you a whiteout of a hemithorax. And it's useful to think through those things as you're in trying to interpret the X-ray. And I put it in this slide, what the, the four conditions are that give you a white out of the hemithorax. One, one is consolidation. One is an effusion. One is collapse, lung collapse. And the fourth one is a mass. So consolidation, effusion, collapse, or a mass are the only four things that will give you a white out of a hemithorax. Now, there's many different types of those consolidations, effusions, collapses, and mass. We'll talk about that, but there's only those four things. And when you're looking at an X-ray, you can determine which one it's most likely to be, and you can rule out some other some other of the other conditions. So in consolidation, the, the key radiographic feature is that you should be able to see air bronchograms. Now, air bronchograms are where you see the, the lung markings, that the uh, the air in the bronchi going out to the periphery of the lung. You should see air bronchograms if it's a a uh, if it's mnemonic consolidation. Um, in this X-ray, there's no air bronchograms, so that makes it makes consolidation very unlikely. The second thing is if it's an effusion, you sometimes not always sometimes see the meniscus sign, which is the appearance of the the fluid as it layers up against the pleural space. Sometimes if the effusion is big enough, you won't see the meniscus sign. And you won't, what you won't see is you won't see air bronchograms. Collapse is another cause of a white out of a hemithorax. And if you've got collapse of the uh, one lung, then the key feature is the way in which the mediastinum shifts. And you should see the mediastinum being shifted to the affected side. Whereas in this case, the mediastinum is shifted away. So it looks like there's something in that hemithorax. Also with collapse, you should usually there's an unusual shape to the to the whiteout. Um, I can I'll show you some pictures of collapse in a moment, but you can get entire collapse of a lung and that can look like a white out of a hemithorax but the mediastinum will be shifted to the to the ipsilateral side to the to the side most affected not to the contralateral side and then lastly is a mass 
And, and the, sometimes you can identify a mass by the shape of the whiteout. And sometimes it's just a dense opacity. Sometimes it's a completely homogeneous opacity that is all white. And sometimes it's a heterogeneous opacity that is the, it's white, but it has other features within it. And that that can sometimes indicate what type of mass it is. But a white out of a hemithorax can be just a mass. The problem with a mass is sometimes and quite often when you've got when you've got a mass in a hemithorax, you'll also have fluid surrounding the mass. And so with many tumors, for example, of the of a hemithorax, you'll that that tumor will be producing fluid or it may be bleeding into the hemithorax. And so you you'll have fluid surrounding it. So it'll look like an effusion with um with uh, a mass effect with the mediastinum shifted to the contralateral side, but you might not be able to determine that it's a mass until you've drained the fluid, and then the shape of it becomes much more evident. So just to, just to go over it again, we've talked about the radiographic features, we've talked about the mediastinal shift. If you've got consolidation, you'll see air bronchograms and no mediastinal shift. If you've got an effusion, you'll see shift away from the side of the lesion. If you've got collapse, you'll see shift towards the side of the lesion. And if you've got a mass, you'll also see shift away from the side of the lesion. But again, you might have a mass and fluid, and you might not be able to see the shape of the mass until you drain the fluid. Remember I said there was only four things that give you a white out of a hemithorax, but there's many subgroups within that within those uh, those conditions. And of course you can have low bar pneumonia, which gives you very dense consolidation of one or more lobes, or you can have extensive bronchopneumonia. Usually doesn't give a complete whiteout, but sometimes it can give the appearance almost of a complete whiteout of a hemithorax. But again, you won't get mediastinal shift and you will get lots of air bronchograms. When with an effusion, an effusion can be just clear fluid like a serous effusion. It can be purulent, so like an empyema. There could be blood, that is a hemothorax, or it could be lymph, like a chylothorax. So there's lots of different types of fluid that you can get uh, causing an effusion. And um, and you can't, you can't always tell that from the x-ray, but you can usually tell that from the clinical picture um, to start with. Collapse, um, there's just lung collapse. And sometimes collapse can be if you've got a, a bronchial obstruction, like a foreign body in the airway, or sometimes it can be um, uh, um, something else causing the collapse, like a mucus plug or something like that causing the, the collapse. And then in terms of a mass, there's lots of, there's a number of different uh, masses that can cause a, um, a mass in the hemithorax in children, most common being lymphoma and teratomas, and another um, sarcomatous type of tumor called a pleuropulmonary blastoma. They're much less common. The common ones are lymphomas and teratomas. I, I said at the start, you will be able to make these diagnoses based on the clinical picture and based on the x-ray findings. Well, really just basic clinical things give you the majority of the information you need to make these diagnoses, but the clinical features are, need to be understood. And so if, for example, you've got consolidation, then you should have dullness to percussion and you should hear bronchial breathing. Now, remember, when, if you've got a white out of a hemithorax, the, the, the part of the lung to listen to is posteriorly. Sometimes you'll hear pathology anteriorly, but much more will you hear it posteriorly, especially if you've got an effusion where there'll be stony dullness posteriorly and markedly decreased or absent, usually absent air entry post posteriorly or, or below the, the level of the effusion. If you've got collapse, you'll have dullness to percussion, but not stony dullness, and you'll have reduced air entry, but not as reduced as much as what it is if there's an effusion. And you may hear air bronchograms because sometimes you will have both uh, mnemonic consolidation and collapse. And then if you've got a mass, it will be often stony dull, just like with an effusion. 
and you'll hear markedly reduced air entry over it. But again, a mass and a fusion often uh, occur together and you don't know necessarily it's a mass until you've drained the effusion or done an ultrasound to see what what the what the fluid composition is or done a CT scan. But I think most of these diagnoses you can arrive much closer to by these clinical features, these radiographic features, and just uh, going through that process in, in your own mind. This is a, um, a child who had a white out of a hemithorax and the and the uh, and it looked like an effusion, and it, and the effusion was drained. And you can what you can see there is what remains after the effusion's drained. And so this is an uncommon situation where you've drained the effusion, but the whiteout persists. And that could be either because you've got effusion and dense consolidation, or it could be because you, there is an effusion and and a mass. And in this case, it was an effusion and a dense mass within the chest, a pleuropulmonary blastoma. But, but it could be that there's very dense consolidation of that upper lobe and you've drained the effusion and now you can see aeration of the lower lobe, just like you can see of the left, left lung. Uh, hard to work out and really only from there it's hard to work out. You'd need to do an ultrasound to see whether it's solid or whether it looks like lung tissue. Sometimes this is an ultrasound looking at what looked like an effusion. And you can see just here, some uh, ultrasound is very useful to uh, explore a white out of a hemithorax more. And what you can see here is this is a right chest ultrasound, a child who had a, 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 a white out of the right chest. And you can, for those who are used to looking at ultrasounds, this is the liver, this is the diaphragm, this is lung tissue, and the lung tissue is all collapsed, you can see. But within the, just outside the lung tissue here, this is all fluid. The black areas are all fluid surrounding this lung. So this is a very large effusion. But it's not just any effusion. It's an effusion where there's lots of septations between. So this is a complex, multi-loculated effusion of the lung. And that can be very helpful in terms of understanding when you... If you put a drain into a, an effusion like this, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes it drains, but there'll still be some fluid there. And that's because there will be other locules of fluid that need to be broken down over time. We can talk about how to do that. But that's um, if you see a white out of a hemithorax, then it's good to go through that clinical process to try to work out what it is and do a chest ultrasound if you can. This is not a white out of a hemithorax, but it's a it's an opacity on a chest X-ray that sometimes it's not very common, but when you do see it, it's worth knowing what it is. And this this is a widened mediastinum, and this is a relatively relatively common tumor in children, and usually due to a th a tumor that arises from the thymus. So a thymic tumor in children will usually not a thymoma sometimes it is but usually it's a t-cell lymphoma t-cell lymphoma or t-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia and you can see that the the mediastinum is very wide you can get that appearance from a number of other conditions if you've got lots of paratracheal lymph nodes and they're all matted and massed together then that can give you this widened mediastinal appearance usually you see that with it looks multi-lobulated. And um, sometimes you see calcification within it, if it's TB, for example, causing um, uh, paratracheal lymph nodes like, like that. This was a case of a child who had a T-cell lymphoma. This is also an unusual, it's not a white out of a hemithorax, but it's an unusual opacity, isn't it? When you see this, you can see the the left lung looks relatively normal. The left hemidiaphragm, you can see. The stomach bubble, you can see. It looks a bit hard to see the tracheal, um, uh, the tracheal air shadow beyond the, the thoracic inlet. And it looks like the x-ray is sort of rather rotated, isn't it? The, the uh, clavicle doesn't look uh, equidistant 
to the uh, trachea and the trachea looks over to one side. But this is the, this opacity here, when you're looking at an X-ray, you should say to yourselves, well, can I see the left heart border? Can I see the left hemidiaphragm? Can I see the right heart border? And can I see the right hemidiaphragm? And in this case, you can't see the right hemidiaphragm and you can't see the right heart border. So you know that there's some, there's some pathology in the middle lobe and the lower lobe because the, the diaphragm abuts the lower lobe and the middle lobe on the right side abuts the, the, um, uh, the right heart border. So there must be some pathology in the, in the uh, right middle and lower lobes. And you can, see some, you can see some air bronchograms within it. It looks like there's some aeration within the, the, the uh, opacity. But it does look like a, a particular shape. And for those who are familiar, you'll know that this represents collapse of the right middle lobe and the right lower lobe. And this is the this is the right upper lobe that you can see sort of almost well, it's hyperinflated because of collapse of the other lobes. So this is both consolidation and collapse. Consolidation because you can see some air bronchograms and collapse of the right middle and lower lobe. When you're looking at an X-ray, remember I said you look at the the inspiration, the penetration, and the rotation. And this is a nicely centered film, and you can see the trachea and the left and right main bronchi, and you can see some smaller bronchi on beyond that. You can't really see the left hemidiaphragm very well. You can see the right hemidiaphragm nicely, and perhaps what you can see are some opacities within the lung, some white patchy opacities within the lung, are both on the left and the right side. If we were to say whether, if we were to say whether this is a, a good a good inspiratory film or not, um, you might count the ribs and let's say it's a bit hard to see rib number one, but let's say this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We don't get close to nine and uh, posterior ribs when we're yes. counting ribs. And if you're counting anterior ribs, this is number one, two, three, four, five, six. Just You can just see the seventh anterior rib. On this side, though, one, two, three, four, five, six. And the seventh one is hardly visible. So th there's it's a not very good inspiratory film. And that doesn't mean the child hasn't taken a big breath. It might just mean that there's collapse of certain parts of the lung or their low lung volumes. And I think we it's useful to think about the types of diseases where there's low lung volume disease. And this is this is one type where you can see there's patchy opacity throughout both lung fields. This is bronchopneumonia, isn't it? It looks like there's bronchopneumonia throughout the lung fields. But there's something else that you can see there. When you see patchy opacity like this, that's the bronchopneumonia. But you can also perhaps see I just want you to have a look over here. What what does this look like? You see an opacity, and then there's a lucency inside it. A pneumothelial. That's right. It's a pneumothelial or a lung abscess, isn't it? That's one of the two, a pneumothelial or a lung abscess. And there's probably a lot of smaller abscesses within this lung as well, or new, tiny areas of pneumatoseal within this lung. And, and of course, the clinical picture is important. If this was a child who's had chronic lung disease, then maybe there's bronchiectasis with, with uh, um, you know, emphysema dilatation. If it's a child who's previously been quite well, but got acute pneumonia, then maybe this is bronchopneumonia with lung abscess. That's the thing, or bronchopneumonia with a pneumatoseal. Yeah. There's a similar picture on this x-ray, maybe a little easier to see, but you can see the, the consolidation, the opacity on the left side, a uh, sort of large area of opacity on the left side, affecting that you can, you, you can hardly see the left heart border, ju only just. And so this is probably an opacity within the lingula of the, of the left lower lobe. You can see a bit. It looks a bit hazy below it too. But the, remember, the right lung has an upper 
middle and lower lobe and the left lung has an upper lobe and a lower lobe but there's a it has a lingula and the lingula is like the middle lobe and it this is opacified and but within it it doesn't just look opaque but as you as we saw in the previous x-ray there's a a, a translucency within this opacity and so therefore that's also like a this is a lung abscess sometimes with the lung abscess you can see uh, an air fluid level and i think you can see it in here there's air there and there's probably fluid below it all right so this is a, a lung abscess within a uh, an area of consolidation uh, i said before that it's useful to have an idea of what type of conditions give you small lung volumes and what type give you large lung volumes because when we're reading an x-ray often we see the we may see the lung the lung either not well in, uh, inflated or very well inflated or overinflated and and you that can really help you in terms of understanding categorizing the types of lung disease you might see so for example small lung volume diseases many of the, the x-rays we've seen so far come from children who've got pneumonia or mnemonic consolidation and they typically lead, lead to small lung volumes. That is, the, the, the number of ribs you're counting is less. And it's not because the child hasn't taken or the, the radiographer hasn't taken the x-ray at the time the child was, was taking a, a breath in. It's simply that they can't take a very big breath in because they've got atelectasis and collapse and consolidation and, and the lung tissue is all collapsed down. And, and so that can occur with pneumonia, be it lobar pneumonia or bronco pneumonia or interstitial pneumonia. And it can occur with atelectasis where you've got just areas of lung collapse. And that can, atelectasis can occur without pneumonia. You can just have that from you know, post-operative pain, for example, where you're not, where a patient's not taking a big breath in, or if they've got some rib fractures, they won't take a big breath in because they've got, um, they've got pain. And that can lead to atelectasis and then you've got a small lung volume disease. All right? the, the other important pediatric condition that leads to small lung volumes is what this x-ray shows, and that's respiratory distress syndrome. And of course, you, you sort of know what you're looking at by the age of the patient, by the clinical picture. And this was a baby who was only a few days of age who had very severe a preterm baby, a few days of age. Well, this is going to be respiratory distress syndrome. And often with small lung volume diseases, you'll see opacities. And this is this, I've shown you some bronchopneumonic opacities and some opacities related to collapse. But this is a this is a particular sort of opacity, and we call it a ground glass opacity. And the reason it's called a ground glass opacity is if you take a sheet of glass and you you grind the edges of the glass, then it gives you uh, an appearance just like this clear glass but you if you grind the edges then you get what's called a ground glass opacity and this is the ground glass opacity of of neonatal respiratory distress syndrome you can mostly seen in preterm neonates of course sometimes seen in in term babies who have who are infants of diabetic mothers sometimes you can see this picture a little bit like that in transient tachypnea of the newborn although the Opacity isn't quite as much like ground glass, but more like fluid. Um, so that's small lung volume diseases. There are a few others, but just just try to think to yourself when you're looking at an x-ray, is this a small lung volume disease or is it a large lung volume disease? And there are some large lung volume diseases, which we'll talk about. I'll show you some x-rays of them. Asthma gives you hyperinflation or large lung volumes, the appearance of large lung volumes where all the all the air, air spaces are over distended. Bronchiolitis is sometimes similar, although sometimes with bronchiolitis, you do get atelectasis as well, or areas of collapse consolidation. And then sometimes with meconium aspiration, because the airways get blocked with meconium, then the, the earliest x-rays will show the baby to be hyperinflated. That's not always. Sometimes it gives you small lung volume disease because there's not airway obstruction, there's just more um, chemical pneumonitis from the meconium. But it, it follows, therefore, that anything that causes 
expiratory airflow obstruction from asthma or bronchiolitis or a foreign body can give you large lung volume diseases. Right? So just, just try to make that distinction when you're looking at x-rays. I find that quite helpful myself. I wanted to show you what looks here like a small lung volume disease. Now, this is, you can see that the lungs don't look very inflated. They don't look very uh, hyperinflated. Let's count the ribs again. This is rib number one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. So there's only seven anterior ribs on the right side. And it looks like the lungs are quite small, doesn't it? And so you're starting to think, well, why could this be? You can have small lung volumes like this if you've got, for example, like we said, consolidation or pneumonia or atelectasis. Sometimes you can see small lung volumes in a child who hasn't taken a big breath, perhaps because they've got neuromuscular disease, they're weak, for example. But here, it looks like there's some, there's a bit of consolidation in the right upper lobe and maybe in the right lung in general. The left lung doesn't look too bad. There's a few hatchy areas, but you'd probably not say too much about that. And it looks a bit like the mediastinum is a bit wide, doesn't it? That could be the thymus, the no a normal thymus in a small baby. This baby was only four months of age, if I remember rightly. And this was taken in October, early October of one particular year. And this baby was followed up. And I just wanted to see what the x-ray looked like just a month later. I think it was just a month or two months later. Yeah, this is one month later. And what, what can you see there? The same child just a month later. Generalized nodular white opacities. Yes, that's right. Generalized nodular white opacities, and they're very fine, aren't they? They're quite. They're not not very large nodules. But so, what what do, what do you think this could be? CTB. Yeah, that's right. Sometimes when we see miliary TB, the 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 uh, opacities are a bit finer than this, and sometimes they're a little bit coarser. So, but what you can see is it's extending over to every part of the lung, isn't it? So clearly, this is more the type of um, uh, mnemonic change that's probably not. Uh, spread through the airway, but spread through the blood, isn't it? Because it's affecting the entire lung, both lung fields. Every bit is in, every bit is affected. And this is miliary TB. This was a small baby who had miliary TB. Very hard to pick in the early stages. Very hard from the 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 first X-ray in October, but much easier by the time one month uh, elapsed. And I think I found this an interesting x-ray because we don't often see the, the progression of miliary TB, but this is how quickly it can, can progress without treatment. Within a month, this child had florid miliary TB, confirmed on uh, microbiology. Now, here's another x-ray that looks somewhat similar, doesn't it? Because there's bilateral, um, you, you might say fluffy opacities, in both lung fields, except it's a bit different, isn't it? It's a bit different because the the opacities are not so fine. They're not fine like they are in miliary TB. Now, it could be that sometimes with miliary TB, they become all rather um, joined up. And so it looks more densely consolidated instead of the very fine reticular pattern you see with miliary TB. But this, is, this looks like... Um, uh, coarse, fluffy opacities throughout both lung fields. The, diff the, diff the other difference is you can see that there's aeration of some of the lower zones of the lung. And, uh, and this, this is a particular pattern that's worth knowing how to interpret. Can anyone tell me what you think this might be due to? It's bilateral, it's symmetrical, um, 
The heart size doesn't look big, so it's not heart failure. There's widespread fluffy opacities, but a little bit of aeration at the base. Sorry, anyone can suggest? What, what was that, Thomas? Uh, fungal. It could be fungal, couldn't it? Yeah, there's a number of things it could be. It could be a widespread fungal infection. Um, this this is uh, relatively typical of severe pneumocystis. This was pneumocystis pneumonia, quite relatively typical of that. Sometimes we see it in the earlier stages where there's only um, uh, bilateral perihyalid changes, and sometimes you see it as florid as this. This is very severe pneumocystis pneumonia. But uh, you're right, Titus. It could be it could be a number of things, especially it could be fungal disease. Less likely to be TB because it's symmetrical and bilateral and widespread, but but it, it could be to, impossible to say exactly what bug it is. But this is fairly typical of pneumocystis pneumonia, and that's what was uh, identified in this in this particular child, pneumocystis. Again, the clinical picture tells the story. Um, I said we'd talk about. So I've talked a bit about small lung volume diseases. This doesn't look like small lung volumes, does it? If anything, these are very, very large lung volumes. And uh, again, you can count ribs, but you can also see some other clinical signs that indicate that there's very large lung volumes. And the clinical signs I want you to look at, are sometimes you see the diaphragms being very flat. And you can see here there's flattened bilateral hemidiaphragms. Sometimes you see the mediastinum be, appearing to be elongated, and so the heart will actually appear to be small, but stretched out um, uh, craniocortally. Uh, that is uh, stretched out, but narrow, and the diaphragms will be flat. And often you see the, the lung fields, instead of being normal or opaque when, opaque when you've got small lung volumes, there'll be more translucent, what we call hypertranslucent. So these are hypertranslucent lung fields with very flattened hemidiaphragm. And you might, you might be able to mark out, this is the right lung here. You can actually see the right lung going all the way across here. And this is the left lung. And you can see it going all the way down. It almost appears to go down below the heart. Of course, it doesn't go down, go um, below the heart, but there's it's be it's, there is also lung tissue behind the heart posteriorly. These are massively inflate, hyperinflated lungs. Can anyone suggest what this might be due to? Well, we talked about the causes of what. Sorry, is anyone suggest? We talked about the different types of large lung volume diseases, didn't we? So with asthma, you can get hyperinflation, hypertranslucent lung fields with diaphragms. So this could be a child with asthma. This is just a child who's got RSV pneumonia, uh, sorry, RSV bronchiolitis, very severe respiratory syncytial virus and, um, and severe airflow obstruction. So sometimes with... Um, uh, severe bronchiolitis. You can see you can see hyperinflation of this degree. You can see this child's all, also been intubated. Has got an intracheal tube in. Has got a nasogastric tube in. But but the lung fields look just like this even before the intracheal tube went in. This is another child who also you can see the massive over distension of the just. Well, primarily of one lung, isn't it? Primarily of the left lung. If you 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 can outline the left lung, and you can see it goes across the midline, and this strange shape to the mediastinum is where you've got the mediastinum pressed across. It's pushing across to the right side, but even the right lung doesn't look collapsed or small lung volumes, does it? It seems relatively large, but there's massive over distension of the left lung. Can anyone suggest what this might be? So if someone's suggesting something, I just can't I can't hear, I can't make out what, what you're suggesting, but 
it, it could be, for example, if you've got a foreign body. This was a child who had a foreign body that was lodged in the distal trachea, very close to the left main bronchus. Now, usually a foreign body will go down the right main bronchus, but in this case, it was it went down the left main bronchus and it caused a ball valve obstruction to the to the uh, to the left lung. And so the child had great difficulty breathing out. Every time the child would breathe in, air goes in, and the child has expiratory airflow obstruction. But because the foreign body was very close to the carina in, in the distal trachea, you do also get some overdistension of the right lung. So if you see unilateral overdistension of a lung, then think about could this be a foreign body or some focal obstruction to the uh, the main bronchus leading away from the trachea. And you can get focal obstruction because of the foreign body or, for example, because of mucus plugging or because of uh, extrinsic compression of the bronchi. And that can be because of lymph nodes or a tumor or a blood vessel that comes very close to the main bronchus. So you can't tell all of that from an x-ray, but you can say that there's massive overextension of the left lung, some overinflation of the right lung. I'm worried there might be a foreign body down the left main bronchus causing ball valve obstruction. That's really what you can tell from the x-ray. Okay, so we talked about um, small lung volume diseases and large lung volume diseases and different sorts of consolidation that can occur within the lung. We talked about bronchopneumonia, bronchopneumonic consolidation, and miliary, a miliary pattern, and lobar consolidation. And we talked about opacity of the lung that's symmetrical, like you see with miliary TB often, like you see with pneumocystis. This is also symmetrical, but it looks different. Can anyone suggest what this is? This is a this was an eleven year old boy who presented with a few weeks of um, respiratory distress, and uh, yeah, that's all. A few weeks of respiratory distress. What what is what is going on here? I'm sorry, Vanessa, I, I, I know you're trying to give an answer, but I can't quite hear you. Um, that's okay. You can see when we look at an X-ray, remember we look for penetration, inspiration, rotation. You should be looking at the airway shadow. You should look, be looking at the heart size. And you get the feeling here, that this, this child's heart is big. Remember yeah. we talked about this before, that the... the um, cardiothoracic ratio that that is the largest distance of the heart the largest width of the heart should be no more than 50 to 60 percent depending on how the x-ray is taken and the age of the child no more than uh 60 percent uh, the heart distance should be no more than 60 percent of the thoracic ratio and in this case it looks larger and you can see bilateral opacities of both lung fields and the appearance of increased vascular markings. So this is, I'm sure you know this, but this is heart failure, isn't it? This is a child who's got a large heart with bilateral pleural effusions and evidence of very severe heart failure. And this could be when you think, when you see an x-ray like this, you've got to go through your algorithm your right your your list of possible causes of heart failure and just to, to think about it a previously well child who develops heart failure but of course it could be rheumatic heart disease where you get di very dilated um, cardiac chambers with bilateral effusions and and increased lung water it could be um, a myocarditis where you've got weak heart muscle and that could lead to this in, the, in this in this case, the pathology was the child went into an arrhythmia and he'd been in arrhythmia for about three weeks and an atrial arrhythmia for three weeks. And that led to heart failure, bilateral effusions and that degree of uh, increased lung water. But it could be anything. It could be a 
It could be a um, pericardial effusion leading to heart failure. could be valvular heart disease leading to valvular regurgitation from rheumatic heart disease or myocarditis, weak muscle, or even severe anemia, profound severe anemia could give you an appearance like this with, with uh, a very large heart or, or, or an arrhythmia. In this case, it was an arrhythmia. Right. So we've talked about lots of different opacities and changes within the lung fields. This is one that you probably fairly easily recognize. But again, you've got um, important to go through the process. Is it a good inspiratory film? Is there good penetration? Is there any rotation? And in this case, it's a good inspiratory film. You can see the the the, the diaphragm are not uh, too elevated, at least on the right side. It looks looks reasonably well centered, um, and it's well penetrated. You can see the ghostly outline of the vertebral bodies behind the heart border. It looks like the mediastinum is pushed all the way across to the right, doesn't it? And you've got uh, some pathology within that left lung, which looks very over distended. It doesn't look like lung, does it? And I think I'm sure you can identify that this looks like bowel within the lung. So therefore, it's a congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And the other clue, of course, is the nasogastric tube's been passed and it goes back up within the thorax. It's not within the stomach where you expect it to be. So there must be, most likely is the stomach and bowel up in the chest of this small baby with, with a, uh, a congenital diaphragmatic hernia. This was another, um, looks a bit similar in some ways, doesn't it? So this was the, the first extra I showed you was a newborn baby. And it just comes out with severe respiratory distress. This was a two-year-old child who presented with a, um, a fever and cough and, uh, and respiratory distress and had an x-ray. Not, not very unwell to start with, but then, but then became very unwell. Um, what could be going on here? In some ways, it looks the same as what we saw before, but it's, it looks different, doesn't it? There's not, there's clearly not bowel in the chest, and this is a two-year-old child. What could be going on here? Well, this is a Oh, sorry, uh, Titus. Sita collapse. A collapse. Hyperinflation of the left lung fields. It could be hyperinflation of the left lung field. The only thing is, it doesn't look like lung, does it? It doesn't look black and translucent. It looks sort of a bit opaque, as if it's full, if if it's got some fluid in it. So that's the that's the dilemma, isn't it? This, this what. If it's not, um, but yes, it it could be hyperinflation of the lung. But what it is is that the stomach is in the chest. So this is a child who's got a diaphragmatic hernia, who had um, was was it was relatively a relatively small diaphragmatic hernia, and the stomach then got in the chest as the child grew, and and for most of the child's life was had no problems at all, then gets a respiratory infection and the stomach is inside the chest and becomes very distended. And sometimes when this happens, it's a rare event to see a, a late presenting diaphragmatic hernia, but this was a child whose stomach had got obstructed inside the chest and the outlet of the stomach, uh, the where the esophagus is, had become obstructed. So then the stomach just dilates and dilates with, with gastric fluid. And uh, this child had what's called a tension gastrothorax, not a tension pneumothorax, but a tension gastrothorax, where the stomach is very dilated. And you can see that the right lung is all pushed across to the, sorry, the lung is all, the mediastinum is pushed across to the right side, just like you'd see with a, um, a diaphragmatic hernia. And you can probably see what looks like a bit of bowel up in the chest too. It might be small bowel with the stomach in the chest. So this was a late presenting diaphragmatic hernia. And to confirm it, you could try to pass a nasogastric tube and you might wonder where the nasogastric tube gets placed. And you can see there the nasogastric tube, this is the same child, the nasogastric tube is placed up within the, the chest. So 
that's where the stomach is. And after placing the nasogastric tube, you can see that the, the stomach then becomes deflated and you can see some, some lung tissue there as well. So a, a rare condition called attention gastrothorax from a late presenting diaphragmatic hernia where the stomach is inside the chest. You can sometimes also see this uh, a, a gastrothorax in a uh, neonate with a diaphragmatic hernia. Sometimes it's the stomach but in, inside the chest, not always is it bowel. Okay, this is another x-ray of um, a problem. And I just want you to try to identify the problem. It's not a very good inspiratory. Yes? Well, again, we go back to first principles. We need to look for look at penetration, rotation, um, and inflation. And it's not a very well inflated film, is it? You can't see. You can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven posterior ribs. So it's a poor inflated um, lungs, and that might be because there's consolidation or collapse or atelectasis of the left lung, particularly where you can see the opacity. Um, but no, there's something else. And that is, you follow the, always look, when you're looking at an x-ray, you're looking at the airways, you're looking at the, um, the, the bones, the heart size, the lung fields, the diaphragms, also equipment. So you need to look, for, look at equipment. And the equipment in this case is a, is a nasogastric tube. And of course, there's not a nasogastric tube in this in this situation. You can follow it down, and it looks like it's going down the trachea, and there's the carina, and it's going down the right main bronchus. So this is a nasogastric tube down the right main bronchus, and very important to be able to identify uh, this um, if you see it. The nasogastric tube is now in the right in the right in the correct place, although. Maybe not so correct. It should be a little bit further down, shouldn't it? That's just at the just below the esophago cardiac junction of the stomach, and it should be in a little bit further than that, even. But this is a child who had pneumonia who had a nasogastric tube placed, and the nasogastric tube got put down the right main bronchus. This 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 X-ray I've just put in because this is an older child, a 13-year-old girl, who there's a number of bits of hardware and complexity to this X-ray. But just to say, this child's lung fields are normal. This is a 13-year-old girl, and you can, in some post-pubescent teenagers, you can see see breast tissue, and that can provide a soft tissue shadow. So this, this uh, young lady didn't have any lung um, pathology, but did, uh, you can see the breast tissue. And the lung, the lung fields are not very well inflated. So again, another example of if the chest, if the patient hasn't taken a big breath, then sometimes you see atelectasis. And if you get her to take a big breath, then often that, that opacity will disappear. So for two reasons, you get a soft tissue shattering of the lower part of the lung. One is the overlying breast tissue, and the other one is that the child hasn't taken a very big breath. So one, two, three, four, five, only six posterior ribs, nowhere near enough. She hasn't taken a big breath. And you might speculate she hasn't taken a big breath, maybe because she's just had heart surgery and she's in pain. So an x-ray can tell you many things and it's worth uh, going through those things. Uh, lastly, I just wanted to talk about, we said we most of what I've talked about have been chest x-rays, but when we're looking at um, pediatric x-rays, we also sometimes need to look at the airway. And usually we just look at the airway in an AP uh, x-ray or a PA chest x-ray in older children. But sometimes you'll need to look at a lateral x-ray. And I just want to try to teach you how to look at lateral x-rays and particularly for um, pathology in the retropharynx. And um, this is... Um, when you're looking at a, a lateral cervical spine x-ray, then you need to know how to interpret that. This is a, I've, I've put this in for two reasons. One, 
to tell you about pathology in the retropharynx, and the other one is to tell you about pathology of the cervical spine. And this is the child's cervical spine. So you can count the you can count the vertebral bodies. This is C1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and T1. So you can just see down to uh the C7 T1 um vertebral body junction. And um and you look to see if there's a if there's a uh if the anterior line of the vertebral bodies all lines up, if the posterior line lines up, this is the these are the spinous processes at the back. If they uh, line up, if they're all relatively um, parallel, and if there's no clear fractures, and the bits in between, which are like the lamina and the pedicles, if they all seem to line up, this is a a, a normal cervical spine X-ray, but the soft tissue shadows is what I wanted you to see. And usually this is this shows you what the width of the vertebral bodies are at different ages. So this this was a child under two years of age. So the width of the, the vertebral body should be around about one centimeter. And this is about a centimeter in width. But the width of the pre-vertebral soft tissues should only be, this is like 9.3 millimeters, so less than just less than one centimeter or, or about one centimeter. And the pre-vertebral soft tissue should be somewhere between half and just a bit over that. So there shouldn't be any more than one centimeter of this, what we call pre-vertebral soft tissue. But you can see that it looks like one, two, probably three vertebral bodies. So about three centimeters of pre-vertebral soft tissue and if you have an older child then again the pre-vertebral soft tissue is often even less so smaller these are not these are in millimeters so quite small pre-vertebral soft tissue whereas this is very large pre-vertebral soft tissue and you can see that with a number of pathologies does, does anyone know what it could be Again, the clinical picture gives you a, a bit of a clue. Uh, in this case, the child was had uh, a strider and a hoarse voice, a very sore throat, was toxic and febrile. And with this X-ray and that clinical picture, you'd be very worried the child's got a large retropharyngeal abscess. It could be like a hematoma or a hemorrhage in a child who's got a coagulopathy or something, but it typically a retropharyngeal abscess, that's what this was, a, a large retropharyngeal abscess. You could get a tumour also in that space, but but uh, this was a large retropharyngeal abscess. Okay, so we've just about gone through all of this, but I just wanted to show you normal x-rays, um, uh, go, go through the clinical interpretation, mostly of chest x-rays, We've gone through normal x-rays, looking for rotation, inspiration, and penetration, looking at the airway, the heart, the diaphragms, the bones, the lung fields themselves, whether it's large or small volume lung disease. We talked about a whiteout of the hemithorax, and we've said there's only four things that give you that, fluid, consolidation, collapse, and a mass. We've talked about lung abscess, and that's like a air fluid level or an air pocket within an area of consolidation. We talked about diffuse interstitial processes like miliary TB and pneumocystis. Could also be from viral infections and, and fungal and other things. And as I say, we talked about large lung volume diseases like bronchiolitis and asthma, a foreign body. We've shown some x-rays of diaphragmatic hernias, both early early normal presentation, I would say, and late presentation. And lastly, we looked at a retropharyngeal space enlargement and how to interpret the cervical spine X-ray in the retropharyngeal space. And in this case, it was a, an abscess, but it could also be a trauma with a hematoma 
or a tumor, but in this case, a red firm geolabsis. So that's really all I want to show you today. It's really just an overview of common pathologies on that we can see on chest X-rays, mostly chest X-rays, uh, and uh, and but I think using the clinical features and the radiographic features of just a plain X-ray, we can make lots of diagnoses. So that's all for today. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have, uh, or we'll uh, we'll just stop there. So thanks, everyone.